During the meditation tonight, we worked with our awareness, our consciousness, directing our attention through inquiry. So there's two wings of Buddhism, the relaxation, the shamatha, and the inquiry, or the vipassana. So these two wings enable, of course, the bird to fly. Pat gave a great talk last week on awareness and consciousness and invited us to turn our attention toward our awareness, to investigate it. So just pause for a moment and just turn your attention towards your awareness, towards your consciousness. And we don't usually do that. It's so big. And then he invited us to try to turn our attention outside of our awareness. And of course we can't do that. It was so great. So continuing with awareness, Please put one of your palms over your dantian, which is about two inches below your navel. And feel the warmth of your energy coming through your palms. So place your other hand, your other palm on top of the first one. So you've got two palms there. And you should start to feel it heat up. And feel how it directs your attention inward. Zen practitioners sit this way to keep their attention in the center of their body. And you can see, you can see how it does that. And at the same time, relax your shoulders. Now open your fingers so that the heels of your palms are still against your body, but that your fingers are pointing outward. Like you're holding a ball next to your body. And feel the interplay of energy from your palms to your dantian. If you can't feel it, that's okay. You can try this later. If you can feel it, take it in, enjoy it. This is our life force, our energy. And it's a good way to begin your practice, your meditation practice every day. So keeping your hands there, turn your attention to the back of your hands. So there's an interplay between the inner and the outer. And that's how we are as humans, inner and outer, balanced between the two. And we want to stay balanced because too much inner or too self-absorbed, too much outer or too codependent. One of the most famous of the Buddha's suttas is the Satipatthana Sutta. The first line of the refrain goes, in this way, in regard to the body, he abides, contemplating the body internally, or he abides contemplating the body externally, or he abides contemplating the body both internally and externally. So the balance is crucial here the interconnection. We're cultivating altruism externally. Our selflessness 
toward the well-being of others, not toward being competitive or trying to rip off others or take over our common resources. So again, the Satipatthana refrain, in this way, in regard to the body, he abides, contemplating the body internally, or he abides contemplating the body externally, or he abides contemplating the body both internally and externally. And you can relax your hands. So we build interconnection, certainly through listening and speaking. And notice the strength of interconnection through sound, which is one of our earliest and strongest senses. Think lullabies. And the sound quality of another's voice conveys as much as what the words mean. When we feel interconnected, we feel like we belong. The country of Estonia is a close-knit one. It has occupied its land for centuries, and in singing its traditional songs together, they've managed the interconnected strength to force out the Russians and the Germans wanting to control and occupy their rich land. In 1991, when Soviet troops again rolled into Estonia to again take control, two million Estonians linked arms, sang over and over their traditional songs, and nonviolently repelled the Russians. There's a great movie on this. It's called The Singing Revolution, and you can watch it online. Now, 1991 was only 28 years ago. But for we Americans, this sounds crazy. Two million unarmed Estonians linked arms, sang and repelled the enemy. And they've been doing that for 100 years before that. And I don't mean to sound simplistic. Of course, there were ongoing negotiations. But the point is... That's an interconnected culture. And currently, ours is not so much that. And for many reasons, it would be beneficial for us to become more interconnected. Interconnection can be fostered in many ways. When I worked at Duke in integrative medicine, I heard Coach K give a lecture to Morgan Stanley executives. He advised them to have the name of the company or the name of the team on the front of their shirt and their individual name on the back of their shirt. The team is more important than the individual. In Southeast Asia and Burma and Thailand, where our practice migrated from, those are interconnected cultures. Our inside practice, Americanized from Theravadan, has only to look at the Theravadan roots to learn more interconnections. Theravadans say they are more devotional and body-oriented than insight practitioners. And among other things, they chant. Pat has done some beautiful chanting for us. I hope he does more. And the Pali language has a unique resonance. When I was young, I felt interconnected through sound by playing in the school band and orchestra and singing in a few choirs. I also experienced a sense of no self by being part of the larger whole. I felt interconnected, and certainly I belonged. I thought we could experience this together through a simple chant, and we'll keep repeating the chant. So as we do it, experiment. Be curious. Sometimes stop and listen, or hum, or don't do it if you don't feel like it. But see if you can catch a glimpse 
when we do it, of feeling interconnected. Now, a really important part is that stuff may come up for you as we do this. When it does, this is perfect. I say that because it's again the perfect time to practice inquiry, to turn toward what you're feeling, no matter what it is. You may find the chanting pleasant, and it's easy. You may find it neutral. It's easy. If you find it unpleasant, great. (laughs) Because then you have something to work with. An inner voice may say something like, this is so stupid, I wish I'd stayed home. I am so bored. This is perfect. It's a perfect time to do inquiry. When that, if that happens, stop chanting and be curious. Ask yourself, why am I aggravated? Or whatever you're feeling. Give yourself some real loving kindness, like, I really hate it when I feel aggravated. To acknowledge it, to notice where it is in your body, might be in your stomach, be curious, where is this aggravation? And then three, the most difficult part, is to, don't, is to not do anything. Just stay with it. Don't even think or try to figure it out. Just stay with it like you're training a dog. You're saying, stay, stay, stay. Be curious while you're staying. Be non-judging. And be curious about what's going to unwind. What will bubble up to the surface? And just stay for as long as you're able, because that's where the learning is. A helpful acronym is RAIN, R-A-I-N. You want to recognize what you're feeling. There's the R. The A is you want to acknowledge that. Oh, yeah, I'm aggravated. The I is for inquiry or investigation. You want to check this out. You want to let this unwind. You want to become intimate with it. That's also what the I is for. You know, this is a very intimate practice in that we get intimate with ourselves. And then N is for non-identification. This isn't about you. This isn't about me. This is true for all humans. We're trying to learn a skill here. We're trying to hang out with ourselves in a friendlier way. So just to recap those guidelines for inquiry, you want to notice that you're aggravated, where you might feel it, or notice what you're feeling, where you might feel it in your body. Obviously, I get aggravated. (laughs) Two, you want to get some loving kindness on board. Yeah, this is difficult. It's a difficult practice. You want to be curious and non-judging. You might want to pretend, this is so interesting. What I'm feeling is so interesting. Let me be curious about what it is. And then the fourth is you want to stay with it. Hold it close. This is pay dirt. This is the practice. Watch it unwind and learn from it. So let me give you an example. One of the first times that I was chanting, actually doing this chant, I was aggravated. I was saying to myself, there was a voice, a part of me that was saying, this is so stupid, so boring. We're doing the same thing over and over. So then I was able to give myself some loving kindness. Okay, I hate this feeling. Where do I feel it? 
And I thought, I feel it in my shoulders. So then the third is to be curious. Okay, I'll look. And the fourth, to stay. Let it unwind. So it was in my shoulders, having to practice the piano over and over again till I got it right. Never got it right, over and over. My mother yapping at me. My mother, arg. Okay, my conditioning. Harsh. So you may hit something that you've already known, but you might realize it slightly differently. Like I'd never thought of the word harsh before in regard to my conditioning. Nor did I realize that I was holding that aggravation in my shoulders. So you might want to end, when you get to something like that, you might want to end, or keep going, see if there's more. And then afterwards to notice how you're feeling. Are your shoulders more relaxed? This is a subtle practice, but subtle is significant. And go slowly. You may want to rejoin the chanting or not. And if, as we do this, you can even get a glimpse of what I'm talking about, it's very beneficial. And if you happen to like chanting, you may have to wait for another opportunity to get aggravated and do it then. So this chant is quite simple. The words are Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani Padme Hum. So let's say this together a few times. Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani Padme Hum. Okay, so let's talk for a minute about what it means. And it has meaning on multiple levels. It commonly translates as the jewel is in the lotus. The Buddha is often depicted as sitting on a lotus. The lotus has its roots, its feet in the mud. And the image is that a human, which is who the Buddha was, can rise above the mud, our own mud, and the mud of the world. So the first word, om, means everything. It's like all the parts of ourselves. Mani, which translates as the jewel, that's our altruism our wish for things to be better for all people. That's the jewel part of ourself. We have lots of parts of ourself, of course. Some better than others, some we like more than others. But the jewel, the real jewel, is our altruism. And Padme translates as wisdom. So... Om, within ourselves, the jewel, mani, is altruism. And when that rests in wisdom, padme, we come to whom, which translates as transformation. So within ourselves, we have the capacity to transform by combining our altruism with wisdom. Let me say that all again. We don't usually hear this. So Om is within ourselves. The jewel is Mani, altruism. When that rests in wisdom, Padme, we come to whom, which translates as transformation. So Om, Mani, Padme Hum. Within ourselves, we have the capacity to transform 
by combining our altruism with wisdom. In that example, in my example, by being able to turn toward my bitterness at having to practice the piano, it would probably, if I stayed with it, it would probably lead eventually toward forgiving my mother. And that would sure get me out of some of my own mud. So this chant is really an aspiration for our studying Buddhism. We can transform all of ourselves, our hatred, our ill will, our greed, our ignorance, our delusion, transform all the parts by combining our altruism with wisdom. So let's chant. We'll do this for about five minutes. So we'll have plenty of time. And then after we stop, we'll be silent to just take a few minutes to soak this in. <clears throat> so normally people have a really nice wooden little instrument to kind of, percussion instrument to kind of keep time with. But I have this um, lollipop drum. But it's, it's just as good. <laughs> I have to explain myself. You don't. This is not the finely crafted wooden percussion instrument. So, um, let's say it again a few times, kind of slowly, and then We'll speed it up and do it, you know, sometimes just listen, sometimes hum, sometimes just stop, you know, see how it's soaking in, see how the words are soaking in, see if this is true for you or what your altruism is. So, hum, om mani padme hum. Let's say it together, om Mane Padme Hum. 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 Om Mane Padme Hum, 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 
Om Mani Padme Hum. 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 And let's get ready to end. Mani Padme Hum. So go back into the body, feel this resonance. Feeling how your own voice, your own life force vibrates and resonates in you. And at the same time, be aware of the backs of your hands. Or turning your hands, turning your palms. Sending this altruism, this jewel of oneself, And feeling the energy of it fade a bit. This is the impermanence. Everything rises and falls. And then you may want to stretch a little bit. Open your eyes. And if you feel like it, take a minute. Turn to a neighbor. Talk about this. What was this like for you? Introduce yourselves. <laughs> and then coming back to yourself. <clears throat> Just see what this feels like now, coming back to yourself, coming back inside. It's like seeing how thin the veil is between the outside and the inside. Experiencing both of these, how rich, how rich it is. And ending with a little metta or loving kindness. As we practice, may we experience transformation and freedom by combining our altruism with wisdom. 
May we balance our inner and outer efforts so that we in all beings, extending to others in the room, to our community, to the Americas, extending to the whole world, especially to those suffering greatly from hurricanes, shootings, earthquakes, tsunamis, poverty, immigration, separation, ill health, to all beings near and far. May we balance our inner and outer efforts so that we and all beings experience health, happiness, safety, the ease of well-being, justice, and peace. And may the merit of our practice be for the benefit of all.